I appreciate the words of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Welcome to St. Andrew's Community United Methodist Church where our mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ. Whether you're here on site and for those of you that are joining us online, we're glad that we have opportunity to worship together today. Let me give you a few announcements as we get started. First of all, uh, I do want to let you know, those of you that parked in the uh, lot right outside our main entrance probably noticed that there weren't any stripes for you to know where exactly you should park. And we've been getting some resealing, restriping on the parking lot. We didn't know it was going to be that way uh, today, so thank you for making it work. But I do want you to know if you have business in the church and you come in, you may not be able to get in that lot because they're going to be doing some work. So if you have business with the church, you can't get in that lot, don't worry. The back door is always open to you. You can walk through the cool air conditioning to get to the church office, do whatever you need to do. We just wanted to make everybody aware of some work that's going on. Also, you'll notice in your bulletin it says uh, somebody's turning 29 for the first time. You all know the, what that's like, right? I turn 29 for the 30th time or whatever it is. Uh, next month, our church turns 29, and we just think that this would be a good time for us to have a little celebration. So please save the date, Sunday, September 11th. We're going to have some special things going on. Details will follow. And, of course, we're Methodists. It does involve food. All right? I was glad when they said... Let us go to the house of the Lord. My hope is that because we're here today, we do encounter God's presence in a powerful way. So as you're able, if you would please stand and let's begin to worship together. Everybody has trials and temptations. Everybody knows our break isolation.
Will you join me in affirming our faith together? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. You may have a seat. Friends, this morning we are privileged to celebrate together in the sacrament of holy baptism. So at this time I would invite the Jensens and those who are standing with them to come. So this is a special day, not just because of this baptism, but six years ago today, they presented Ezra for holy baptism. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And then lastly, will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Yeah. All right, we're having fun up here. I just wish y'all could see this. Can, can, I, can I take you? Can you come with me? <laughs> oh. ah! This is so fun. Ain't she a cutie? All these people are looking at us right now. It takes more than what a family can do by themselves to keep the vows that were made today. If all of you would do everything in your power with Christ as your helper to support this family, to let this precious girl know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, would you let them know that by saying, we will? We will. Awesome. That was all for you, girl. All right, and y'all may notice we've got this. This is what happens to Methodist preachers when we get old and retire. Reverend Grant Paul is here. Sam Basler, founding director of Criminal Justice and Mercy Ministry, and I'm going to ask him to come up and also participate in this. So what name is given this child? Ella Joy Jensen. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. She's yelling at you, not me. I just want to point that out. Let's pray. So, holy God, today we give you thanks for little Ella Joy, and we pray that for the rest of her life she knows that she is loved by you by the way she experiences love through her family. May she grow to truly understand your grace and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. And at this time, we will invite the children to follow Miss Susan. Oh, and 
bring their backpacks up. That's what they were going to do. This is a change. That's why we have a script when we bother to read it. So we would ask the students to fill the aisles at this time. Just go in the middle of the aisles, and then you all who are seated and are not students, you all are students, so fill the aisles. Yep, yep. You are. Um, the students will go in the aisles, and then adult-type people who are um, lifelong students, you get to stand up and go lay your hands on a backpack or on a shoulder or on a head, and we are going to pray over these students and their school year this year. So this is the participatory part of service today. Stand up. We are going to pray over their backpacks, and then every student gets to come up here and pick their own color of lanyard. And I just want to read to you the verse that we have on the bottom of their lanyard. It is Proverbs 1, 7 through 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hear, my child, your father's instruction, and do not reject your mother's teaching, for they are a fair garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Dear Lord, thank you so much for these students and for letting them know that you are going to be with them wherever they go, wherever they carry their backpacks, and wherever they learn and have instruction. Lord, we also know that whatever they teach when they are young, they will take with them throughout their life. And we ask that they know that their church is behind them, their church is praying for them and supporting them and letting them know that you are the Savior, you are their Lord of their life, and that uh, this church will be with them and praying for them and supporting them wherever they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Come grab your lanyard. Amen. So when we worship through our tithes and our offerings, there's a whole list of things that we are supporting here at St. Andrews. We're recognizing that the gospel always comes to us on its way to someone else. We're recognizing that as followers of Christ, we not only have a response of repentance and following Jesus, but we have a responsibility to be light of the world and salt of the earth. And there's a, a great list of things that we're supporting here both locally and globally in mission and ministry. And one of those ministries that I want to highlight this morning for you guys is called God of No Limits. Um, and weekly, we are feeding a homeless community um, every single week um, through God of No Limits. And just recently, they have had uh, their refrigerator go out. And uh, so I can only imagine how difficult it would be to try to continue feeding people on a weekly basis with, in the heat with no refrigerator. And so because of your generosity um, and joyful giving and worshiping the Lord in that way, we were able to say as a church, hey, you know what? We can buy you a new refrigerator to continue this ministry as we continue to feed this homeless community weekly. So we thank you for that. Um, you, uh, there's a whole other list of things that we do with um, the money that is given each week, and uh, we'll be highlighting that over the next several weeks, um, the, the different things. There are two giving stations here in the front and one in the back. 
Um, there's also a text to give number in the bulletin and a um, QR code if you'd like to give that way. You're free to come up during this next worship song. Um, or uh, give as you're leaving this morning. Um, those worshiping with us online, on the screen is a text to give number that you can give that way. stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You're a miracle worker, you're a 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. St. Andrews is a loving, caring, overcoming community of faith centered in a relationship with Jesus. And there's a lot of ways that we can love and care for one another, but I can't think of a better way than when we pray for one another. And so that's what we're going to do over these next few moments. It's going to look a little bit different, though, than normal. Normally, I will go through the list and and I will pray. Um, But this morning, we're going to just sit in silence. We're going to sit in the presence of God. And as these names scroll behind me, we're going to... Pray for them as the body of Christ. I think sometimes, uh, especially now, there's just so much noise in our world today. And and I think there's times where we just need to sit in the presence of God and allow the Holy Spirit to do a work. And so I invite you this morning as the names scroll, um, let's sit silently praying for these people that are a part of this body of Christ that we love and care for dearly. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, for your greatness, for your power, for your majesty. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your love, your mercy. We thank you for the ways at which you are at work in our lives and in the life of this church. We lift up the many ministries and missions that we partner with and pray for blessings for them, for open doors for them, for opportunities to share the gospel. We pray for those in the church who need healing. We pray for your will to be done, for your healing hands to surround them and to encourage them. We pray that you would bring them peace and comfort. We pray for relationships throughout the church, for reconciled relationships. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in our lives in powerful, powerful ways, in ways that maybe we haven't seen or experienced yet, in ways that we read about in Scripture. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We thank you for DA. We thank you for the word that you have placed on his heart this morning. We ask that you would anoint him you would fill him with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would continue to help us to to rise up, to stand up, to be who you've called and created us to be, who you have empowered us to be, light of the earth, light of the world, salt of the earth. Blessed to be a blessing. We pray that we would, as we leave here this morning later on, that we would be your hands and feet, that we would enter into the world 
and recognize that you are with us always. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died and resurrected, defeated death, defeated sin, defeated Satan. We thank you, Lord, for the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So in the, the, that quiet, kind of tranquilizing atmosphere, hearing the music during prayer, it's kind of like some of y'all I've get, or you're just drifting off into the arms of Jesus. So we're going to do a little exercise. Get us woken up, make sure we're awake. Now, now understand that this exercise is not going to make you break a sweat. It's not going to get your heart rate up. This is more of a mental exercise. If you're like me, that's kind of a challenge. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to do, here's the exercise we're going to have this morning. I'm going to make a statement that's going to be incomplete. I'm going to leave a blank at the end of it, and you're going to fill in the blank. Just whatever, however you want to answer it. There's not any right or wrong answer. You just go ahead and, and speak that out. But I will say that some of these questions are such that you may think there's a right or wrong answer. Don't worry about that. You just say whatever comes to your mind. For example, if I were to say uh, a bird in the hand, you might say is worth two in the bush, or you might say it costs about $10. Or if I say, um, you know, just some kind of crazy statement, a penny saved is still not worth very much, okay? Uh, y'all got the idea? Y- y- I guess y'all are ready to exercise. Anybody need to stretch? Now, if your neighbor falls asleep, just poke them on, okay? All right, first statement. You've got to know when to... Fold them. <laughs> know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. And know when to run. You've got to know when enough is enough. You've got to know when to quit. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do, but I was pretty sure most of y'all would channel your inner Kenny Rogers on that one, all right? The next one. If you build it. <laughs> yeah, see, because I whispered that's what you said. You could have said, if you build it, you've got to count the cost, because that's biblical. All right, let's go to the next one. There's nothing. <laughs> Same response in every one. I didn't really cue you up. There, let's try it again. There's nothing. Well, y'all are really drifting into the arms of Jesus right now, I can tell. It's a good thing we're doing this exercise to wake you up. There's nothing to fear, but fear itself. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. My goodness, people, we just said that a while ago, and you've already forgotten it. All right, let's keep going. When you come to a fork in the road, <laughs> come to the ro- fork in the road, take it. That's what Yogi Berra said. Some people would say, when you come to the fork in the road, take the road less traveled. Some would simply say, when you come to the fork in the road, don't run over it. <laughs> all right. Last one. It's all fun and games until. Put that in a search engine. It'll come up. It's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye. It's all fun and games until somebody calls the police. It's all fun and games until someone eats the last donut, thank you, or until somebody drinks the last whatever it is you're drinking. All right, very good. I'm glad I got through all three services and nobody said what I thought somebody might actually say out loud. But this is a statement that's been going through my mind as I continue to think about the creation of the church. The one that comes to my mind is it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt. When somebody gets hurt, it's not fun anymore. Somebody gets hurt, it's not a game anymore. And when we talk about the church, what we're now going to see is that through the experience of what God is creating, 
people are getting hurt. Now, I want to review real quickly what we've done because I want to make sure that you're really grasping what we're talking about when we talk about creating the church. God created and continues to create the church. And we first hear that word when Jesus asked the disciples, who do the crowd say that I am? And then he asked the most important question we ever answer, who do you say that I am? And when Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the one we've been waiting for, Jesus says, it's on this foundation, on this rock, that I will build my church. And that's the first time we ever hear the word church mentioned. But then we get into Acts, and specifically Acts chapter 2, and this is when the Holy Spirit is now poured out on all people who believe. And we say this is actually the birth of the church is when the Holy Spirit is given. So one thing that I want us to understand, biggest picture, or maybe we should say the foundation is God creates the church out of people. People just like you. People just like me, rich people, poor people, tall people, short people, people from every nation, people from every tribe, every language, anybody that God has created, God creates to be a part of the church. And in that, what we have to do to become a part of the church is we've got to turn from our sin and turn to God. And if we haven't been, then we experience what Ella experienced a while ago, we experience baptism. Turn from your sin, turn to God. Be baptized. You can be a member of the church, capital C, that God is creating. Nobody's excluded. Everybody's invited. And so God's creating the church out of the people. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all those who believe. And now we see that the people that God is using to build the church are devoted to to discipleship. They now have a shifting of priorities, a high level of commitment to four things. The first is they were committed to the apostles' teaching. The apostles were teaching them, here's who Jesus is. This is what Jesus taught. This is how Jesus wants us to live. But they were also committed to fellowship, or some translations say community. The Greek word is koinonia, and we looked at how in koinonia there's concern for and dedication to each person's highest good. There's healing when there's hurt. They were committed to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and they were committed to prayer. Those four things, Acts 2.42, that's what we read. God creates a church out of people, and here are the devotions that people have to their discipleship. And then we read that as a result of our devotion to discipleship, we experience personal transformation. We always wonder, how can I change? Well, the truth is, sometimes we may have the willpower to make changes in our life, but for most of the serious stuff we deal with, we understand we need the power of the Holy Spirit within us to help us make those changes. And the changes that we saw in the early church is suddenly people become more bold. And suddenly people are are more generous, sharing the resources that God has given them to steward over. And Josh shared two weeks ago how it is that they were called to obedience. As they continued in their discipleship, they began to experience personal transformation. And then last week as Josh preached, he said, here's the other thing that we see, and, and this was so Simple. I don't know how I've missed it all these years. So glad that you shared this. When we read Acts, it says that God added to their number daily, but we get a few chapters past chapter 2, and it says, and God multiplied. Now it's no longer addition. Now it's multiplication. This is rapid growth, and rapid growth brings with it growing pains in the church. Whenever a church is on a high trajectory of growth, when our church experiences a high trajectory of growth, we must know that the Holy Spirit always moves faster than our ability to keep up with it. And when we can't keep up and we have those growing pains, then we have to figure out, okay, God, what are we supposed to do next? Sometimes when we look at the church in the book of Acts, we may find ourselves in that place where we're asking the question, how come we don't experience that anymore? How come we don't experience the rapid growth, the multiplication that the church had? 
And some people would suggest, well, it's because we aren't as connected to the Holy Spirit as they are, or we don't have that same level of devotion that they had. We're not experiencing life transformation. People would want to say, if we could just be more like the first century church, that early church, church would be much different today. And therefore, you will hear people say, well, you know, we've got, we've got a New Testament church. Well, here's what I want to share. It's actually something that I heard Andy Stanley say once and say, wow, that makes a lot of difference in how we understand it. He said, if we're really going to be like the first century church, then everybody in here ought to be going into a synagogue and telling them about Jesus. Because that's what they did. Most of them were Jewish converts to the Christian faith. And I think they didn't know any better. They just kept going to places that they thought were sacred, to the temple, to synagogues. But then they wanted them to know the Messiah the Christ, the one we've been waiting for has come. His name was Jesus, and here's what happened. And when they went into the temple and they went into synagogues and they began to tell this, it was not well received. I mean, we can imagine how we might respond if people came in here and started telling us the things that we believe about Jesus are wrong. We probably would not respond very well. And when they were telling them about Jesus, it was not received well. And so you know what the first warning is, right? Verbal warning. Threat. You quit preaching in the name of Jesus or else. And of course, their response was to leave and ask for more boldness. And they continued this. They continued to go in the temple. They continued to go to the synagogue and, and teach. And when they did, they finally got past the verbal warning. And now they said, this isn't going to happen anymore. And they had them arrested. They had them thrown in prison. And while they were in prison, there were some that said they deserve to be killed because what they're saying is blasphemy. Now, there was a wise elder in the churches or in the, the synagogue. His name was Gamaliel. And Gamaliel said, look, look, you don't need to shed blood. You don't need to kill these people. That's ridiculous. I mean, guys, this isn't the first time this has happened. There have been others that rose up, and they got a following, and people said, oh, this must be the Messiah, and it wasn't. So just leave them alone. If, if this really isn't of God, it's just going to go away. You don't have to worry about it. However, <laughs> if this is of God, you don't want to mess with it. You don't want to take it on. So the leaders in the temple thought that this was good counsel, and instead they chose just to have them flogged, just to have them whipped and beaten in the same way that Jesus was, just not as severely. And those apostles, as they laid there in pools of their own blood, they weren't thinking, well, I'm never doing that again. They weren't thinking Man, we got to get even with these guys. They weren't thinking any of the ways that we might find natural to respond because they knew that Jesus had said, you need to respond differently. And they continued to preach and teach until finally, one of those seven, the seven that Josh preached on last week was a man by the name of Stephen a young guy, and he had to preach about the resurrection of Jesus and how we need to turn from sin and, and turn to God. And they had had enough, and they ignored Gamaliel's warning, and they took Stephen outside the city, and they stoned him to death. And once you shed first blood, it escalates. Let's read what happened from Acts chapter 8. A great, war, great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Brothers and sisters, 
This is the word of the Lord. The reality of persecution is something that's hard for us to relate to. We enjoy great freedom. We enjoy great privilege in in our nation of being able to to live our faith openly, to come and and worship together without fear of people coming in and trying to do us harm. I I, I know there's some exceptions in some places about that, but you can can put on your favorite Christian T-shirt and you can wear it out in public and most people aren't going to mess with you. You can go next door and talk to your neighbor about Jesus. They're probably not going to punch you in the nose. We enjoy such great freedom, it's hard for us to relate to the persecution that they have had in the early church. But brothers and sisters, let us make no mistake. The church has enemies. God has enemies, and if God is creating the church out of people, the church has enemies enemies. There are people, there are powers, there are principalities, those things that we said cannot separate us from the love of God. Those things exist and they seek to destroy the church. They seek to destroy the mission that Christ has given to us. The early church, they were all there in Jerusalem and it says that they scattered. They went to Judea and Samaria. Now, that's interesting because I think that Jesus said, wait here in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, brothers and sisters, when the church scatters, it doesn't leave Jesus in Jerusalem. It takes that message of salvation to these other places But it was persecution that caused them to scatter because they were content to stay in Jerusalem. And as they scattered, they went to Judea and Samaria, but we also know they went to Europe and they went to Asia and they went to parts of Africa because they're trying to escape this persecution. And yet there was one government, one ruler, one emperor, one Caesar who ruled over all those places because it was all under the authority of the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire began to crumble, who did they blame? It was all fun and games until those Christians showed up. And so they brought the Christians and they took them into the Colosseum where they made martyrs of them by making them just be sport for gladiators and wild animals. We could continue to go on and look historically and see, even up until the present day, how Christians are persecuted because there are enemies in the church. And what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to sit there and take it? Are we supposed to stand and fight? I mean, let's be honest, sometimes we kind of feel what Peter felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. You're coming against Jesus. Man, give me a sword. I'm going to start chopping ears off. But Jesus said, no, Peter, that's not it. you got to act differently. Well, how do you act differently? Well, I don't know that there's a singular answer to that question. Sometimes it's wise to run and hide. Sometimes it's wise to take a stand. But what I will suggest to you is this. The mission that God has given the church thrives when we continue in faithfulness. You see, those Christians didn't stop gathering together for the apostles' teaching. They didn't stop their fellowship. They didn't stop sharing of meals and the Lord's Supper. They didn't quit praying because all this happened. Instead, they continued that high level of devotion where they experienced life transformation so that the church would continue to go. The church thrives in the midst of persecution when we continue to be faithful. Now, I don't, th- think, think about our time. Think about the world we live in. Think of a country that, that you might know or be aware of where being Christian is neither popular nor well-received or maybe it is persecuted. There's a lot of countries this still happens today, but one of the countries that I think is hard and yet God is thriving in the midst of the witness so that the church is growing is the nation of China. In 1949... 
the Communist Party took over China. There was a group called the China Inland Mission that sent missionaries to China. They had 637 missionaries in China in 1949. All of them had to leave when the communist government took over. You can imagine there was, there was great confusion and great angst and what's going to happen and how's this thing going to do. But four years later, many of those missionaries that had left had been redeployed to Japan or other places in Southeast Asia, through persecution, the church is scattered and the gospel continues to be shared. But what was going on in China? Would it surprise you to know that there are more Christians in China today than there were in 1949? In fact, the church continued. It was underground. People met in homes. I've heard stories of people that had to smuggle Bibles into China because of the oppression and persecution they had. Y'all know that we support a Chinese missionary, don't you? She's in the province of Norm An. Yeah, just right down on the campus of the University of Oklahoma, Reverend Fuchsia Wang, and I'm going to tell you, friends, I will partner with her forever because she does more good for Jesus than just about anybody I know. Every year, every year coming out of that ministry, we hear the stories of students who said, I grew up in China, I was an atheist, I did not believe in God, and when I came to Oklahoma, the person that was willing to meet me at the airport was Reverend Fuchsia. And they began to go to Bible study, and they began to hear this testimony about Jesus. And we get to hear the testimony. We're going to see some pictures and hear more about this in the next few weeks. of The people that grew up atheists that now profess faith in Christ and have been baptized. Did I have a witness this morning? When we walk in faithfulness, the church continues to grow. And we can think that's all that that ministry does, and we would be so mistaken and overlook something vitally important. Because those students that find new faith in Christ when they're at OU, you know what happens to them when they graduate? They have to go back to China. They don't leave their faith in Oklahoma. Instead, they meet underground if they have to. They meet in houses, and the church continues to grow. Woo! That's some powerful stuff. The, one of the early church fathers, a guy by the name of Tertullian, wrote this. He said, kill us, torture us, condemn, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. For the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I mean, we're just worried about people blowing us up on Facebook. And people have died to share the good news. And when they've walked in faith, the church thrives. It doesn't shrink when hard times come against it. You can go to Southeast Asia. You can go to Africa. You can go to other nations where the gospel is put down and the church is growing. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, it moves faster than our ability to keep up with it. So whenever we gather here, whenever we come together on Sunday morning, brothers and sisters, what we ought to understand is we don't want to wait for persecution to be able to go out and share the good news with people. We don't need to use our privilege to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, somebody will take care of it. <laughs> no, we, we gather together because the thought is when we leave here, having been together, having experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we ought to get recharged when we come. You see, the church that God created is the charging station for our faith. One of the big things is, you know, we, we got electric cars now. Have y'all been to Crest lately? Driven through the parking lot where they got the charging stations where your, your, your electric car's about to run out of charge? You can charge it right there. And you can drive it till it runs out of charge again. That's what happens. We come here and we get charged up and we go out there and we got to come back. We got to recharge. We continue to walk in faithfulness. Let me tell you about something that happened. Maybe this will help you all a lot more because uh, this is something that happened here. It didn't happen overseas. When our family moved here, 
in 2006, the Community Life Center had just been constructed, just finished year one of Upward Basketball and Cheer. That CLC was constructed because the fastest way to reach people when we came here was through recreational ministries. That's not the case anymore, but that was the case when we came. And that's why we've got two basketball courts side by side so we could have upward basketball and cheer, bring kids in, teach them how to play basketball, teach them how to cheer, but most importantly, teach them about Jesus because that's our mission. And when we did that, it, it, it was so good because we had privilege in more public schools. If we wanted to advertise... Uh, our basketball league, all we had to do was follow the rules, and we could call Fisher, we could call Early Wine, we could call Wayland Bonds, we didn't call South Lakes because it didn't exist yet. <laughs> we'd call those schools and we'd say, How many students do you have? 225? Okay, we're going to bring 225 registrations for upward basketball and cheer because we know that you have a sacred place to put them. Do you know where the sacred place was? It was called the Thursday Folder. Do I have a witness for Thursday Folders this morning? That's all. We, you know, we, we would put them in the Thursday Folder, and now thousands of students in more public schools, if they want, can be a part of Upward Basketball and Cheer. It was great. And then suddenly, one day, without warning, we couldn't do that anymore. No, we, 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 the Thursday Folder was too sacred for us. No, what they told us was, um, you know, if you want to bring some up and put them on a table and they're just there and if somebody wants one, they can get one. <laughs> I have very clear memory of the staff meeting right after we learned that. It was not very well received. It was not well received by people in the church. They could not believe that that had happened. Guess who was stopping that? Guess who caused the ruckus for that? I mean, I may be wrong, but this is a story I was told, so y'all know it's true. It was other churches. Because they didn't understand why their, their kids would come home and they'd have that St. Andrew's thing in their folder. Maybe they had something else from another church in their folder. But when their church would go up to the school with 225 brochures, they would be told no. Well, that's because they didn't follow the rules. You see, we didn't just take them to the schools and say, would you do this? No, we sent it to the administration building. And if the administration building said, yes, you can do that, then we took them to the schools, and the schools were glad to help us. But other churches, they just thought, well, y'all are playing favorites. We don't want to do this. And so finally, and I don't blame them a bit for it, more public schools said, you know what? You can put them on a table. We're just not going to get into that anymore. Now, somebody did tell me after the last service that that's changed, but that's not in my notes, so we're not going to talk about that. How can we have upward basketball and cheer? How can people come if we can't put this in the students' folders on Thursday so that their parents can register them? It was terrible. It was devastating. <laughs> We'd always had about 200 students that participated in that. The first year they said we couldn't do that. We had 300. The second year we had 400. And my response in the midst of all of it was this. It was never the school's responsibility to do our job. It's never someone else's responsibility to carry forth the mission that Christ has given to the church. It is our responsibility to scatter. It is our responsibility to get out there and tell people the good news because Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. You're the people that give life flavor in the world. You are the light of the world when darkness closes in on people. You are the ones that help that light to shine because we know that Jesus is a way maker, a miracle worker. He's light in the darkness. That's who he is. And that's what we share. The last verse that we read today said that when they took Stephen out so they could stone him for blasphemy, 
that people were getting worked up. They were taking their coats off, and they laid them at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. And it said that Saul suddenly went from door to door, dragging people out, both men and women, to have them arrested. He wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. We don't have time to talk all about that today, but most of us don't know him as Saul. That was his Hebrew name, but his name in Greek was Paul. The greatest missionary in the history of the church. The uh, author of most of the New Testament. And I think if Paul were here for us to exercise today, he would say, fill in the blank. If you can't beat him, would y'all pray with me? Holy God, we bless you. Thank you so much that we can be here today. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit is present. Help us, oh God, to be tapped into the sources of that spirit that through the devotion we have to you that you begin to transform our lives and give us the things that we need to be effective in sharing the good news. Let us not take our privilege for granted, but let us always share good news with love and grace and respect so that people come to believe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you desire a time of prayer, if you want to come up, we've got our prayer stations here. You're invited to do that. But as you're able, would you please stand as we sing and worship? Yeah, though I walk through the valley, I know that you are always right beside me, and I will fear no evil. You're my Sweet sound, I hear you singing.
Friends, so glad you could be here today. Go in peace.